Mike Culey was only 19 when suddenly he experienced what he calls an absence of self. It's a story of non-duality. I began to have experiences that were, um, well, terrifying is, is the best way to describe them. From the Isle of Man in the UK, Mike reports on a compelling story of self. They were just glimpses that there was nobody here. Not nobody meaning that the, the thing called me, Mike, that I thought I was, would somehow drop away. There'd be an absence of self. So, so I would have these, these experiences fairly, fairly often, um, these openings. You know, they were very common in my first 10 years or so of meditating. And then I, I came across the non-dual teachings. And, and at first, it just did not make sense. I couldn't grasp literally what they were saying, which is, you know, there's nothing to do <laughs> because there's no one to do it. So what helped Mike a lot when a book showed up out of the blue? You know, when I got to page three or four, it might have even been the introduction, I don't remember. But I read a sentence and it made the entire universe stop. <laughs> Everything you are experiencing in this moment is none other than your own awareness. And I just, I got it, it clicked. Not as an idea. Um, I looked around and everything was me. I was everything, I was also nothing. And as soon as I noticed that, as soon as I realized, oh, this is it. This is the very thing I've been searching so hard for. And yet it's always been like this. A huge surge of terror. <laughs> it <laughs> kind of it erupted from my belly. Where'd that come from? Terror and fear, just a part of the journey. But for Mike, they do not last. Welcome to Mike Culey's ever-revealing experiences and understanding of non-duality. This Sojourns interview was recorded on May 10th, 2021. Welcome to Sojourns from the uh, Island of Man in the middle of the Irish Sea. We have a special guest with us today. I want to introduce Michael Culey. Uh, because of his many experiences, which will advance, I think, in all of us, the understanding of the pursuit of self-awareness, let's just call it that. Thank you for joining us, Mike. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, and I have a couple of key questions I want to ask about some seminal moments in your young life so far. But just before that, a little bit about your spiritual background from your childhood to where you are today. And welcome. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Ted, for inviting me. Lovely to, uh, to speak with you. Um, so, yeah, my background. So I, I was um, born and raised on the Isle of Man. My, my dad uh, was a teacher of Buddhism, and he also spent time as, a, as an ordained Theravadan Buddhist monk in the Burmese tradition. So as I grew up, um, we had lots of people visit the house to meditate and, and hear about Buddhism. And we also had my father's teachers, who were Burmese meditation masters, uh, visit the house and spend time with us. And, you know, growing up as a small kid, you know, I didn't really know what the reason was why people would want to sit still and cross their legs and burn incense and things like that. But, uh, but that was kind of what I grew up around. Um, you know, statues of the Buddha, the kind of uh, etiquette of the Dharma Hall. You know, I, I would sneak in there, leave my shoes at the door as a five-year-old, do something like this in front of the Buddha statue and, and run out again. Um, so, yeah, my first kind of uh, encounter with the word enlightenment was through Buddhism. And it was also a kind of... Um, striking in that i mean the whole point of, of buddhism is that the buddha was not a god you know he was a human being and um and his enlightenment was therefore something that all human beings could also um attain or achieve or, or realize for themselves so i had this um 
notion or belief or sense from, from a fairly long, a young age that enlightenment was available, not as some kind of esoteric, distinct, separate experience, but somehow it was here already, somehow it was waiting for me at my core. So I had the idea that um, it was already here somehow, even though I didn't really know what it was or how to access it. And I also had the, the, uh, the conviction, I suppose, that um, the whole point of being alive was to realize that. That was the point of living, or certainly the point of my life. And I want to add also that I heard you say in another talk that we were on together, a bunch of us, that you were at the ripe old age of seven when you first heard the term self-enlightenment or enlightenment. So that's been on your consciousness in one way or another for many years now. Yeah, that's right. And my, my dad, who was a Buddhist, you know, was not just practicing meditation, etc., to be a good Buddhist. He was actually practicing to also realize the enlightenment of the Buddha. So, so that was my, that was my um, model. My model was you get enlightened because that's the point of being alive. It's not to make money. It's not to be rich. It's not not to tick off the list. Or you know, it's to realize. Um, who what you are so yeah that's my model growing up as a small child so you couldn't have understood you couldn't have understood very well at least so it seems to me what enlightenment really meant in your formative years when was it that it started to dawn on you the deeper significance of this all-powerful end of the rainbow existence called enlightenment well, I mean, as I grew older, you know, as I grew older uh, and began to struggle, as we do as a teenager, you know, with my mind, with emotions, with reactions to, you know, just struggling with life, um, I began to not just read and study things like Zen Buddhism and, uh, you know, the Hindu, Hindu traditions, but begin to practice meditation because my mind was a mess, I was anxious, I was um, you know, depressed and things like that. So that seemed like the time to start because I wanted to change myself. I wanted to change my mind and my emotions and my reactions. So I began to meditate um, seriously or formally in the teens. And um, as I began to do that, um, I began to have experiences that were, um, well, terrifying is, is the best way to describe them. Um, not, not even, I mean, they weren't particularly nightmarish or they were just glimpses that there was nobody here. Not, nobody meaning that the, the thing called me, Mike, that I thought I was, would somehow drop away. There'd be an absence of self. You understood how the process was likely to work well before you actually experienced it, I gather. That losing your identity of self, as we think of it, mind, body, self, was just going to be an enormous change in your life. Yes, and because I didn't know, you know, I was reading and studying about enlightenment, and I don't think I read anywhere that it would be terrifying and destabilizing and, and, and would freak you out, certainly for you know, a teenager. Um, so, so I would have these, these experiences fairly, fairly often, um, these openings, mm -hmm. but they, they were always terrifying and um, they kind of, you know, they were very common in my first 10 years or so of meditating. Did, um, you, change, did you turn and, to your yeah. father for solace? Did you turn to somebody more knowledgeable than yourself for, for support? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the whole time, my whole kind of, you know, practice career has been a, an ongoing conversation with my dad, you know, about these themes. We'd, we'd sit in the car in traffic talking about impermanence and no self. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and it was, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I had that. Um, but I did come across the, the notion quite early on that that the Buddha was right. And what I mean by that is that, you know, 
I was I would be looking in the wrong place if I was looking for some kind of external pot of gold at the end of the rainbow experience. Um, so I, I came across teachings of non-duality, like Nizagadatta Maharaj, uh, Ramana Maharshi, and um, some of the Zen uh, patriarchs, early Zen masters. And at first it was very confusing because my whole uh, attitude was, you know, I know it's here, but how do I get it? How do I, what do I, when do I, how long should I meditate for? What's the right meditation? Um, and I was exploring all different kinds of traditions. You know, I've got degrees in religious studies and I was studying and traveling to, you know, the East and, and investigating Sufism and Hinduism. Um, and then I studied Western traditions like alchemy and, you know, the esoteric traditions of, of West because I was kind of trying to put it all together, you know, what's the big picture here? Um, and then I, I came across the non-dual teachings and, and at first it just did not make sense. I couldn't grasp literally what they were saying, which is, you know, there's nothing to do <laughs> because there's no one to do it. Now that bit made sense, of course, because it was like, oh, Oh, I know, I know that. I know that, that what they're talking about. Only I found it terrifying. But the idea that there was somehow nothing to do, achieve, aim for, practice, you know, that's very, our whole mind is set up to advance and move forward and, and progress. So to have the kind of rug pulled out from under it, saying that the mind's efforts are essentially useless, was both completely freeing because it just lands you exactly where you are. But it, you know, it did take a bit of time for me to kind of realize that, are they really saying that there's nothing to do? And the reason there's nothing to do is because this is it. <laughs> it's already it. You know, how could this mundane, boring moment <laughs> be it, be God, the divine, enlightenment, the universe, whatever word we wish to call it, how could this be that? Um, so yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you want me to move forward from that point or we'll stop there for a little bit. I think it's important to um, discuss how we can move forward with this wonderful topic that you're engaged in, not just from the teachings of your dad from, uh, from first person experiences yourself. When I heard you talk on a Wednesday Zoom gathering um, with a Ramana Maharshi group, you're excellent and you gave it methodical step-by-step -step approach to growing up to your first experience. In this case, maybe it's the reporter in me that wants to get to the, the, the meat of the discussion first and then fill in the gaps along the way. So if it's okay, you're still a young man, but you were younger at the age of 19 when you had this first seminal experience. And then I think you said it was about 10 years later, I guess maybe you were 29, when you had a follow-up major experience. Let's talk about those now and then mm -hmm. fill in some of the gaps after, after the viewers here have a chance to hear what you've been through. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. So, um, so after hearing these non-dual teachings, which made complete sense on one level, um, I began to see if I could find some living teachers. You know, I spent my whole life reading dead Japanese meditation masters. And I thought, <laughs> hang on, it's about time I met some living, some living people who embody this understanding. So I went to India in maybe 2006 or seven, and I um, spent some time with Ramesh Balzakar, who was uh, one of the translators of Nizagadatta Maharaj, who was we a very, very elderly man. We Sorry? met him, we met him, my wife and I, when uh, during our trips to see Sai Baba would go and see him in his home and be greeted by many Westerners who would sit and listen to his stories endlessly, just as you did for a long time. Oh, fantastic. Wouldn't it be funny if we were there at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> could have been. It could have been. It could have been. 
so so and he was a, a real revelation for me um in that for me his whole um approach and what kind of oozed from him for me was a, com a, a kind of complete ordinariness a complete just there was no pretense there was no you know there wasn't even a kind of spirituality that he was pointing to it was very much this is it you know and just reminding everybody that there's no separate self you know i, I sometimes tell the story that um he used to just sit there with this big mug of chai and written on the mug was best granddad in the world <laughs> you know like that's how ordinary he was there was no there was no kind of um you know fireworks around him it was very just a straight presentation getting straight to the core of the matter and so that so i stayed with him for a, a few weeks just kind of soaking up what i could um from him and um, whilst i was there someone mentioned that there was a uh, another teacher <clears throat> similar to ramesh in london and he was a, a man called tony parsons so um i when i got back to to england i went down to london and spent some time uh, visiting these meetings that tony parsons would put on um where again there's no fluff there's no lead up there's no build up it's there's nobody here you know there's nobody listening to these words there's nobody talking it's all just spontaneous it's all just happening it's just life that's what's happening in this room, life, you know. And, and then it really started to sink in. Um, and, and I really appreciated Tony's teachings and I, I would call him up sometimes on the phone and speak to him and then, you know, ask a question or share, a, share an insight. Um, yeah, and then, you know, other teachers uh, meeting Muji and uh, who else? Oh, and other teachers in Tiruvannamalai and, you know, just kind of exploring. That's, sure. you know, exploring. And yet... It, it sounds very similar. It sounds very, very similar to two people many times your age. Uh, and when you mention Muji, of course, that touches both of us because he's been enormously instrumental in this pursuit. In fact, in this very room did a two-hour interview with him via Skype from Portugal. And so uh, ah. it's good to see the background being filled in, which led you to your mm. further understanding of who you are. Go ahead, please. Well, well, just the main, the main emphasis from all these teachers was that you're it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to do, you're it. Uh, and what was what was um, what was fantastic was that kind of built confidence in my own initial uh, hunch or sense that I'm it. I don't know how or why I am, but the idea that this realization is not an external thing, it's it's it lies at the core of us. The problem was that apart from these terrifying glimpses I would have every so often, both in meditation and just you know, walking down the street, which were, was when it was particularly scary, when I wasn't even meditating, the, the kind of self would fall away. And um, I hadn't realized it, you know, intellectually, it made, I could give a talk on it, intellectually, it made complete sense. But I hadn't experienced it intuitively, directly, so that got to be really frustrating and that actually started to cause some real trouble so there was kind of a split in, in in myself you know on one hand i completely understood that there was no inherent me no inherent self dividing this experience here from the universe but uh, practically <laughs> i was still mike trapped in my body you know and for the second time in my life, the first time was 19 when I, when I really struggled and I was depressed and life was very tough. 10 years later, when I was 29, um, I experienced that again and I, I began to get desperate, I suppose, uh, very desperate, very demoralized, um, depressed, 
in fact, it was kind of a breakdown. I was studying, I was in the middle of my master's thesis, which I think I said on the other talk was, was on enlightenment. I mean, that was what my thesis was on, uh, which is, you know, just the worst topic to be writing 30, 40, 50,000 words on. Um, and I, I just hit, I hit a brick wall. I didn't want to think anymore. I didn't want to write. I didn't want to be me anymore. I mean, that was really what emerged. I, I didn't want to be Mike anymore. Mike wasn't working. Um, uh, I would, you know, suicidal thoughts began popping up. And uh, yeah, I was ca having a kind of breakdown, you know, a, a, a real crisis. Uh, a friend of mine said to me earlier that year, oh, you're 29. Oh, you'll have your Saturn returns. That's usually quite turbulent. <laughs> and I remember just kind of <laughs> laughing it off. <laughs> no, she, she was right. It was a turbulent year. Um, but I had the kind of um, self-awareness, I suppose, to realize that, you know, I didn't actually want to end my life. I just didn't want to live in my head anymore. Mm. That, that was the real difference. And I'm so grateful that whatever part of me was able to see that difference. So um, I then totally stepped away from spirituality, my books, you know, talks on enlightenment, visiting countries. I, I, I'd stopped, I quit, I'd failed, I didn't get it. And I went to see the counselor, my, my therapist at, at university, because I was studying at the time. And, you know, throughout my whole practice, throughout the, my teenage years and my childhood, of course, there's things that it felt like my meditation practice had never really touched or, or was able to soften or transform, you know, childhood experiences. And again, nothing, nothing profound or, or deeply traumatic, just, I suppose, what we all go through as being children and young adults and having families. And so there was a lot of stuff that was just never really um, explored, I suppose. Um, so this counseling uh, experience, which was about four or five months, was really liberating because I didn't really want to talk about spirituality anymore. I wanted to dive into why I was depressed or why I was sad or the relationship with my family. And actually, every time I left her office, I felt lighter mm. and, and more alive and, and, and strangely more free than I had done chasing enlightenment. She was and helping I, and I thought, you. She really was. Um, and of course, you know, all she would do was nod and say yes and, and reflect back to me what I was telling her. But yeah, it was really liberating. And I remember thinking at the time that my meditation practice had been like, like a hot air balloon trying to lift off. But in the basket, there were heavy rocks. So it was kind of bobbing. But the, th the therapy, the counseling was like I was actually able to dump these rocks and I was getting some height at last. And I thought, okay, that's great. I don't have to get rid of Mike anymore. Mike's okay. Mike is actually making sense now. Mike is working. Mike feels good. It feels good to be a person. And that was really radical for me because I'd spent the last at least 10 years trying to get rid or see through the person. The person was a myth. The person was an illusion. Get, you know, the person doesn't count. And suddenly I'm having this uh, liberating experience of, of being a person with a personality. And it was just really freeing. Um, after one of those sessions, um, as I, you know, as I've, I've told this story a few times, after one of those sessions, um, I felt particularly kind of good about myself. And um, just before the next session I had, I went and sat in the library, which 
was where, where I would go and I'd read before the next appointment. And as I was sat there, I noticed that just by my head on the shelf was a copy of uh, Rupert Spira's book um, called The Transparency of Things. I, I'd come across him on a show called Conscious TV and he really impressed me. And I'd, I, I thought, you know, I'll get around to reading his book at some point. But of course now I'd quit. You know, I'd quit the spiritual search. I wasn't interested anymore. But just by chance, that book was right over your head. And I know of him because I learned about him the same way you did. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of times, and that's not an exaggeration on our own path, people have said similar stories where, I don't know where this book fell off the top shelf as I was walking down the hall. And, uh, and it would change a life as I suspect you're going to say this happened to you. That's, that's it. That's it. Um... <laughs> So it was there and I, and I thought, okay, well, you know, I have an hour. So I just began reading, but I was reading casually. I wasn't studying every word like I would have done previously. You know, it was almost like I, I'm over this. So I, I'll just kind of leisurely, you know, go through the, the, the pages. And, you know, when I got to page three or four, it might have even been the introduction, I don't remember, but I read a sentence and it made the entire universe stop. <laughs> Don't go on. Don't go on. You said this in the group when I was present, and I was chomping at the bit. What did that sentence say? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well, okay, from, from memory, it. Um, so he was talking about the nature of non duality, mm -hmm. and he used a really clever um, analogy which was he, he was saying that you know the page that you're reading and the ink of the letters that, that you're reading are not two separate things there is not paper and ink the the ink is the paper and the paper is the ink it's one entity and then he went on to say and in exactly the same way everything you are experiencing in this moment is none other than your own awareness and i just i got it it clicked not as an idea um i looked around and everything was me <laughs> say more i mean to say me is confusing because i've just said there, there was no me i was everything i was also nothing you know um, and as soon as I noticed that, as soon as I realized, oh, this is it. This is the very thing I've been searching so hard for. And yet it's always been like this. A huge surge of terror. <laughs> it <laughs> kind of it erupted from my belly. Where did that come from? Well, that's the same thing that happened previously every time I would have a, some kind of opening, some kind of no self experience. There would just be this surge of terror. So I knew it well. And I, you know, I thought, oh, well, here we go then. But this time, this time, it, it kind of rushed up into my chest. And as it, as it kind of gushed through my, uh, my heart, it, it just exploded. And it just fizzled like a like a firework in the sky. It just fizzled out. And that was it. And the fear was gone. And I was still looking around. And I was still everything and everyone. And yet there was no one here. Um, so I then started to laugh. Um, you know, because it was the most joyful recognition of my life. You may have seen people in front of Muji break out in sheer laughter and he would join them and everybody else would join them for similar, if not identical reason. That, that's it. You know, you, you hear of people and, and you see them, of course, uh, uh, laughing when they when they get it, because it's such a, a joyous recognition. But it's also uh, what I recall was how ridiculously obvious it had been for 29 years 
and it was literally in front of my face the whole time whether i was in india or pakistan or the isle of man or it, in front of ramesh bell it doesn't matter where i was or depressed doesn't matter it was always here looking directly at me so so that was the kind of it was so odd. how could i miss this the nature of what is how could i miss that miss that it, it in the sense that you are it or it is part of your identity say more use words you're good with words give us a, even a greater glimpse of this remarkable transformation in your life so so at that stage um it was completely that there was no me left there was no me as something experiencing something it was it, i call it the collapse so Good there was word. no me there was no me and it or me and awareness or me and god or me and the room the whole thing just collapsed and and there was just this seamless oneness um which you know i i sometimes call awareness or consciousness or i also in that moment um saw that it was god god was looking at itself god was always experiencing itself were you thinking of god dualistically is in a way manner of speaking outside of yourself thinking of god apart from yourself or yourself <laughs> no no and i'd never really well i'd never used that word i mean I, christianity is something i know very little about compared to other traditions but what happened was i i had this uh, experience and because i was laughing i, I suddenly became kind of self-conscious and thought i have to leave because i'm in a library i mean people are studying and i'm suddenly you know laughing my head off so I, I i walked outside and there was this little garden in the middle of the campus and there was nobody in it and there was just a bench and i sat on this bench and everything was god everything was god word, just that word seemed to fit suddenly <laughs> and that that it, did that everything include you Yes, everything, just everything. There was just God experiencing God. You know, I think somewhere in, is it maybe in the Bhagavad Gita, they talk about water being poured into water. I mean, it was just, you know, everything was just one thing, one thing experiencing itself. And, and everything was so radiant. And, and at the time, it was like, It was as if everything had become like a Van Gogh painting. Mm -hmm. Everything was so beautifully intense. Everything was shining and radiant. And it was just, it was glorious. Everything was glorious. And, and I sat there. Uh, my mind had um, gone, died. Mike had gone, died. Um, and I just sat there for about an hour and I just basked in this beautiful non-dual recognition of who I was, what everything was, the simplicity, how obvious it always was, how I kind of, well, it's not true that I wasted my life, but I spent a lot of time running around looking for something that was always present and how ridiculous that was. Uh, and how funny that was and um and then i remembered that i actually had an appointment um <laughs> with your counselor yes suddenly that thought kind of you know struck so i i, and I, I you know everything was kind of just wide open so it was hard to just to kind of walk out of the garden and think oh, you know what am i doing and I went to sit uh, with her in her office and she would say, you okay today, Mike, how's things? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't talk. I mean, I couldn't talk because I was her and I was the table and I was the room and she was God and the table was God. <laughs> <laughs> so I just couldn't speak. I couldn't think. 
But anyway, she was savvy enough and knowledgeable enough to know that something was happening. So she just said, you know, let's, let's check in next week. And, um, and then I, I, I got the bus back home. And by the time I got home, everything had kind of got back up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, by the time I was sat at my desk having a cup of tea, uh, yeah, everything was kind of normal again, but something was different. Something was gone. Something hadn't come back. And that was Mike. Mm. That was this separate self that had somehow seemed to divide what I was from the rest of the world or other people. So I that, that had, yeah. I want to make sure I get this. Um, I'm in a group on Thursdays here in the States where there's four men whom I know very well by now. And I really respect where they're coming from. And of course, they never say they're awakened. They never say they're you know, more closer to enlightenment than the average, average Joe. It's quite apparent they are. They sound a lot like you. But when people talk about this recurring theme in your life that you've experienced, the loss of self, okay, intellectually, those words I understand, and I try hard to understand it at a slightly deeper level, but is there a way you can give us even a little more of an understanding of what does that mean? Mike is walking around with the loss of self, and he's happier than hell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, because, I mean, you're right, Ted, in a way, it's complete nonsense. <laughs> you know, it is, it's complete nonsense to say, there's, there's no self here, or there's no self talking, or I realize no self. Who realized no self? <laughs> Who's talking now? You know, it is nonsense. Uh, agreed. I mean, this is words, and this is language. So I think a better way to put it might be that what fell away uh, in my experience, was the the veiling or the uh, the belief, although it was more than a belief, in a separate self. The identity of a separate self, maybe? Yeah, like an autonomous controller that mm -hmm. lived in my head, that had choice and did this and not this and was real. And that controller would steer me through my life. And that controller had to do a hell of a lot of hard work because it was basically managing the whole show without any help from anybody else and would have to continue doing that until the day that this body dies. So you're saying you don't have any choice in the manifestation of who you are today? Well, at that point, I think I would agree. At that point, there was just, it's all just the ocean. Mm -hmm. you know, the wave is not choosing where it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, it might think it is, yeah. but even the thought is just more water. You know, anything the wave does is essentially made of water. So it's, it's fine if the wave thinks it's going that way. Because that's also kind of part of the movement of the ocean. Yes. So, so there's a kind of functional, practical self that we have a personality you know that's part of the ocean but there isn't such a thing as a real bona fide findable tangible concrete self in here that's doing all the work that's pumping your heart that's choosing you know to drink red or white wine that doesn't exist and i i, I sometimes use the analogy of father christmas or santa claus you know uh, He's real until he's not. <laughs> yes. About the but, age of five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't stop you enjoying Christmas and, right. and Father Christmas. You can dress up as him. You can indulge in the belief because it's, you know, it's, it's a nice thing. But he's just not a tangible, real thing. So on that level, there is no self that's doing, um, doing life. Quickly, how much did this surprise you, the realization at the age of 29, 
under your dad's tutelage, under the influence of Buddhism and your teachers and the monks and people you, you knew from the age of seven when you under, introduced to enlightenment, did, you must have one day thought that, well, if, if I'm a success on this spiritual path, I'll lose this sense of self. Did you, did you ever think it was going to actually happen to you? And how different was it from what you anticipated? I could never have anticipated how simple it is. That's what uh, everybody uh, says. It's subtle uh, and it's simple. It's subtle and it's simple. And another word, uh, you know, yet another word would be grace. You know, that, that it's got nothing to do with you in a sense. It's, it's already so given, which is so beautiful that it's already given to you before you start looking for it because it is you does that mean you're special mike because you've received this grace and you must know hundreds maybe thousands of people who've been trying twice as old as you are who have yet to realize this why aren't more people joining in on this self-exploration discovery well first of all i'm as special as you know one of the blades of grass in the garden <laughs> <laughs> um you know uh, but I do think people are beginning to get this. I mean, even here on the island the other day, a young, a very young guy got in touch with me to say he's had this experience. Really? And, and he's glad that he's, you know, knows of someone uh, that he can share it with. Wow. How big is the island of man? How many people live there? 500,000? Uh, no, no, no. It's it's no, no. It's eighty five thousand at the moment. So two people out of eighty five thousand on the island of Man that we know of are already there. Oh, I, I know more. I know <laughs> at least a, a small handful of people um, here that have had. And, and I don't like the word enlightenment because it sounds so big and final and it's so mythologized. Well, awakened they, is a word I see used a lot. That's sort of between here and there that seems to fit pretty good. Yeah, in the sense that they, they have had an experience whereby they are no longer limited to the identity their mind gives them. And while we're talking about this, surely you must be the youngest person I've ever come across who's been able to speak from first-person experience of this. Do you see younger people starting to pursue this as you've been pursuing it? How old are you? <laughs> I am. 45, 42? Oh, close. 41. 41. Okay. So, so this last experience happened just at 29. And so it's been over a decade that you've had these experiences. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and what was also interesting, again, just in terms of, you know, that was kind of 10 years ago, was, you know, I knew instantly, or it was recognized instantly that there was never there will never be another need to seek a spiritual experience that that just died i mean that just died on the spot because this is you know it's all the spiritual experience you're never not having a spiritual experience so so the, a huge kind of there was no more no more projecting no more seeking no more looking um it's all got the same taste, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about one taste. Everything has the same taste. It's all divine. It's all it. <laughs> I can't what, tell you how happy I am personally for you. Your dad must be very, very thrilled. Is he proud of his son that he raised to be on a spiritual path? Well, I, I, I should hope so. <laughs> and it, it's, it's nice that we are able to connect on this level because, you know, he has also had his own deep experiences. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes I do reflect a little bit or, or I'm able to stand back a little bit and, and, and consider that perhaps this isn't so common for a father and son. It isn't common for anybody, period. Um, so from other teachers and friends who are, let's say, awakened, just to use that word, uh, they report that this is happening as well. That's great. More and more people. I mean, of course, it all depends on how you're defining it. 
you know sure. are are you are you kind of moving up the tiers or the hierarchy or jumping through hoops or are you realizing that you know you are already it or it is already the case um but you know either um people are reporting that more and more people are awakening even in buddhism uh talking about stream entry which is the kind of initial awakening to no self i've heard teachers from the buddhist uh tradition reporting more stream entry and you know in my own life i teach mindfulness or what i refer to as mindfulness which you know involves a deeper exploration of who and what we are and even within the people that i work with on the island you know there's a handful of people here that have certainly had glimpses mm -hmm. already of something bigger uh, than themselves than that small mind based identity and i actually think you know i think to be able to point someone towards a part of themselves that is already um aware and silent and quiet and awake is not maybe that difficult you know there's certain traditions where they use pointers direct pointers look at this examine this notice this rather than like with me i was just kind of meditating for over a decade not really knowing what i was doing other than other than calming down my mind body emotions which is great you know finding that stillness is fantastic but and and what and then you know suddenly there'd be this burst of no self that would be absolutely terrifying like suddenly the structure of mike has gone so uh, you know I, I was grateful to meet teachers who were more direct with me well i'm happy to say that your story resembles hook line and sinker you might say very very similar <laughs> to everybody else's story that I've heard who, who have claimed to have this experience sweep over and transform totally who they are, who they thought they were, and who they are thinking about today. Uh, in fact, even about the background that leads up to such a thing, you explained very well how you got there. One of the four members of the group, another man I've interviewed in this room via Zoom where he lives on the east side of our country, Norio Kushi, a Japanese American man, not that much older, well, maybe a decade or so older than you, a cross country lorry drink, driver, you know, the semi truck uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, that's 3,000 miles, and, and, and raised with no religion, no spiritual bent or interest of any kind whatsoever from a very intellectual background, became self aware. It's a long story. It's it's on Sojourns, if anybody wants to see it. Very similar in the experiences that you recount here. And we're all motivated by something. My motivation is to share. Actually, I heard that from him. Norio, I asked him, why are you telling me this story? Because I was interested. And, and he says his first answer was because I feel compelled to share this. Uh, and speaking of that, I, I think it's um, you're trying to spread your story too, and I think it's coming up in the form of a book which is not quite finished yet called The Living Moment. Are you going to recount all of these events? Well, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, there's a draft, there's a first draft of a book, um, and I, I've been I've been writing it for years, <laughs> years. Uh, well, ever since I was 29. Now, you have a big story to tell. Well, it's quite the opposite. This doesn't mean that it's a huge, hefty tome. It's quite the opposite. Um, what I found is, I mean, I said earlier that in a sense, when, when, you, when you wake up, um, in a sense, it's the end. It's certainly the ending of something. Yeah, that's gone. You're, you're, you are in love with life because you are life and everyone you encounter is life, whether they know it or not. And it's just so joyous and beautiful. But um, what doesn't end or what hasn't ended for me is the sheer amazement at the variety, the infinite, endless variety of it, awareness, God, consciousness, the universe. I mean, no two moments are alike. 
you know. So even though there's not a search anymore for something other than, you know, what's happening now, um, there's certainly been different insights. Just like, I mean, the analogy I use is like a diamond and it's multifaceted, you know, a diamond. And yet all of all every facet is different, and yet it's also the diamond. You know, so every moment is brand new and unique, and yet it's also the same in that it is this uh, consciousness or God or divine or whatever word you, you want for that. So, yeah, so the book is called The Living Moment in the sense that the moment is alive. And how are you so certain? Other people talk just like you do. And I, I can't help but wonder, how are they so certain they have found not just part of the answer, but the whole story? How do you know? No, I'm definitely not certain. In fact, I'm not certain about anything. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, that's the, that's the awakening. It's, it's, it's a funny thing. Everything I've discovered so far with certainty also contains within it the exact opposite hmm. which is uncertainty i mean and i don't i don't mean as a kind of um like an like an anxiety it, it's an unknowing it's a it's the impossibility of knowing what this really is i mean i've called it awareness god you know you call it any name you want but they're just words you take all the words away we don't know what this is. Now, you can experience the fact that whatever it is, it's the same as you, or you are the same as it. You can experience that, the falling away of separation, of being it. No, you're not in it, you are it. You still don't know what this is. <laughs> one, minute it's being a one minute it's being Ted, having Ted's coffee and breakfast. The next minute, it's this openness of awareness where you're everything. The next minute, it's a moment of anger, or the next minute, it's uh, beauty what shines through, the beauty of this, or the grace of this, or the suffering that can also be in this. And it's all allowed, just like every, every wave is made of water, every facet is made of the diamond, every moment, no matter what it contains, is ultimately none other than um, that which we seek. When I first heard you talk, um, it was my impression that the first big, really significant breakthrough for you was when you were a teenager, I guess 17 or 19, I believe. And, and I thought the secondary uh, occurrence in your life at 29 was just maybe more of the same or a follow-up uh, to what you had initially as a, as a younger man. It sounds like the 29-year-old experience was, was the major factor that's reshaped your entire thinking and your being. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that, that was, um, yeah, that was the, the most um, outstanding moment, yeah. let's say. Yeah. So as a younger man, was that just a, a foretaste, a little bit of a glimpse of what was to come for you? Or did that make you feel pretty satisfied that you are now aware of the new dimension of your life? Um, well, the, well, it was the, I think it was the same experience. Hmm. It was almost the same experience fighting to come to the surface. But all through my late teenage years and through my 20s, I was unprepared psychologically. And so... You know, there would be terror. I'd be terrified at this emerging glimpse of no self. Mm -hmm. But that's the glimpse. Yeah. You know, that's the moment. The moment you realize there's not actually anybody in the way. So I'm the going to start. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. Well, that was it. So, you know, through, through the 10 years of, of practicing and failing and, and certainly the, 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 the counseling, I think something just relaxed. And this time, when I read the right sentence and this um, experience bubbled up to say hello, for whatever reason, in that particular moment, I was ready. I was able to fully allow that experience to unfold. 
Do you see the irony here? That Rupert Spira's words on that page in ink weren't just the right moment. It was the whole experience you are destined to go through immediately from that point forward that will forever change your outlook and your life. It was the very thing. It was the very, you're right. It was the very thing in words that I was looking to experience. And the way he wrote it so beautifully allowed me to have that experience for myself. And I did write to Rupert. Well, I was going to say, I was hoping you would, because if you didn't, I will. Uh, I did, I did, and I thanked him, yeah, and he replied, it was, yeah, lovely. Oh, that's but, great. Um, yeah. So, uh, just a couple of, it said in the business, you know, as a journalist for 44 years, news stories would last anywhere from 25 seconds to a minute and 25 seconds. So this is sheer luxury, luxury to be able to talk in depth like this. But because so many people are doing similar things now, the research says don't ever go beyond 45 minutes. People with attention span will start to seriously wane. We're about at that point. But I do want to ask some follow-up questions here. And if we go along, that's fine too. I might break this into two parts. Is fear all gone? Do you have a fear of death? It's a good question. Um, I'll tell you when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, where you part a, that's where you part a little bit by, from some of the other people who, who yeah. say, no, there's, that, that does not enter the equation at all. Um, and maybe they use different words to explain where they are than I've heard yeah. you. And, I, and I've seen teachers that, that you know, would say that there's, there's nothing left to fear. But I, I also like some of the Zen masters who, you know, on, on their deathbeds are saying, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm really scared now. I'm really scared. And their disciples are saying, no, 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 no. Of course, you, you, you must mean that you're, you know, this can't be true. You must be teaching us something or no, 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 no. I'm really scared. Um, and the whole point is that that is allowed. You know, we're not trying to repress fear or kind of say, oh, of course, I'm not scared of death anymore. I've got no idea what death is. And, and maybe it's just not real anyway. I mean, a lot of people talk about this, the space that you've used, the word awareness, uh, that is unborn, that has no end, that's eternal, that just continues, that, you are, that they feel as if they're already there. I don't want to put words in your mouth. And that, that would render moot the whole question of the death of the physical body, I would imagine, too. Um, it's like deep sleep, yeah. Yeah, you it's know, like the, deep sleep. Yeah. The outer, the outer falls away. Yeah. So yeah. what are you going to do with yourself for the rest of your many, many years remaining? I mean, you, what's next? What holds any surprise, excitement, or uh, challenge for you? Well, again, I mean, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know if this is my last moment. So, sharing. You said the word sharing earlier. I mean, that, 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 that comes with the realization. You know, I, I find it impossible not to share. I agree and, with and, you. I think it's very important that you do all you can. I couldn't not share. So, on one hand, um, you know, once upon a time, before I had this experience, I, I said to myself, you know, Mike, when you become enlightened, I'll probably just be a, a kind of homeless, vagabond wanderer, <laughs> and I'll sleep on park benches, and I'll, I'll walk through the countryside, you know, and I'll just kind of, that would be my lifestyle. Uh, and now, after actually having that experience, I'm married, I've got two children, um, I teach mindfulness, um, and I'm really busy. I mean, I, I run a festival, um, a well-being festival, where I invite other speakers on these kinds of themes to come to the island and share, mm -hmm. so we can really spread some ideas and some experiences with people. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I work with with people. That's what I do. I, whether teaching them mindfulness or um, pointing them towards something deeper, writing, um, 
so I am busy in that sense because that's the just that's the nature that's the outpouring mm -hmm. you know is to is, is just to share that you're already it there's nothing to seek there's nothing to find what you're looking for is where you're looking from two final questions it might be a third one tacked on here uh one is i agree with you completely and and i've been warned by others well don't go around and proselytize if people have a you know a negative disposition predisposition towards that and yet this is so important in lives and in my life you know i've, I've spent years pursuing just the intellectual understanding of what you've experienced at your young age, that I want to share that with people. And so I'm finding ways to do it. And I encourage you to even think more positively than you already have to make sure that you continue to do that too. The other question, uh, so that wasn't a question as much as it was a statement. Ramana Maharshi um, is one of the linchpins. Let me rephrase this. Understanding the true work of Ramana Maharshi was self-inquiry, self-investigation, answering the question, who am I, over and over again, has been of enormous help for me personally. Now, that's a practice. That's a process. I hear people say, and I think I heard you say about the Buddhist teachers, don't turn towards practices too much. You might miss the forest for the trees sort of a thing. Do you know much about him and his teachings? And do you subscribe to that notion that practices may not be as useful as they could be? At the moment, in my, let's say, in my understanding, um, is that everything is both already it. There's no practice required. There's no effort required. There's just, it's just a natural recognition, just as you would recognize your face in the mirror. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've spoken about there's no practice, there's no person, and there's nothing to do. Well, the opposite is also true. You know, I'm Mike and I'm talking to you and you're Ted and you're listening. And we have this unique personality that nobody chose we have this unique body that nobody chose. You know, it just happened. And we have these practices. And on one hand, they're useful for practical purposes for the mind. I mean, all practices are for the mind. You know, you are what you are. That doesn't need practice. But the mind doesn't know what the hell it is. <laughs> you know, the mind thinks it's a body. The mind thinks it's a thought. The mind thinks it's a, what it says on the driving license. That's not what you are. <laughs> That's just stuff so practices can be useful either to um calm the mind down so that there's no veil of thinking between you and experience there's just this seamless unity or to turn the mind back on itself as in to look back or inquire back into its own source so you know if i say now i practice I don't practice because I lack something. I don't practice because I'm trying to get something. I practice, and this is why practice isn't such a good word. I practice as an expression of what I am, both as, as the absolute and as Mike, without any difference between the two. And as so, the final question, would you mind sharing what your present day practice is? My guess is it's changed from what it was maybe a decade ago. I mean, yeah, yes and no. So the whole notion of practice is now different, as I say. And for a long time, I didn't have a practice at all mm -hmm. um, because it was just seen that, you know, the person practicing had never existed. It's like, again, it's back to Father, uh, Santa Claus. It's like leaving out the, you know, on the Isle of Man, we leave out, you know, a mince pie and some, you know, like a sherry or, or a glass of wine for Father Christmas. Well, you know, once you realize he doesn't exist, you don't need to leave out the pie and the sherry anymore. Um, so, you know, I stopped practicing because there's no one to practice. There's no one uh, who needs to practice. But after a while, I began to miss sitting quietly as nothing, as no one, as simultaneously everyone. I mean, 
And that was what I was the rest of the time, whether or not I was sitting in a coffee shop or walking down the street, that was still the experience. But I kind of fell in love again with meditation, not to get something, but just to be and to, to, to know that being more intimately and more intimately. So, uh, so yeah, I have a real love of practice. I mean, this weekend, this forthcoming weekend, uh, I'm, I'm holding a silent retreat, a three-day silent retreat, very much on the kind of um, Buddhist-style mindfulness practice. Lots of sitting meditation, lots of walking meditation. But I also invite people to investigate practices based on self-inquiry and direct pointing and talking about who we are and what we are and exploring what we're not. So to me, I, I, I'm kind of past caring anymore, you know, being on either side of that coin. Oh, if you're enlightened, you don't talk about practice or if you yeah, it just, it's all allowed. We're allowed to practice. We're allowed to be personality. There's no barrier. As they say in Zen, the gate is wide open. That's a great answer. Really, thank you. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> my, my hunch was that maybe I shouldn't go there and, and put you on the spot and ask or describe, to describe your, your daily practice, but I'm really glad I did. Um, I really I appreciate, I, I appreciate that question as well. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I want to tell you, I've got three pages of questions here. They're all good questions. And you never ask one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe one day, if you are up for it, uh, I'd like to come back and do a, a follow-up in a couple of years or so to see where you are. This has just been a delight, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll let you know when it's posted to Soldiers, and I know it's going to reach people who are already looking for it but don't know how to find your story and with great meaning that will help them see their own lives continue to evolve as they pray and hope and wish it will. So thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you. My Thank pleasure you, to be here on my end, just asking the questions. And you were so forthcoming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a great experience. I've really enjoyed myself tonight, uh, chatting to you and, and listening to your questions and seeing what answers, uh, you know, pop into, into my head. So thank you very much, Ted. You're welcome. See you the next time. See you next time. Bye -bye. No, don't go.